Welcome back, everyone, to Rodium Radio, episode 338. Isn't it crazy that this is episode 338 and the name of my guest, his name's Eight? What a coincidence, huh? But I want to thank everybody who tuned in tonight, everybody who liked, commented, subscribed, everybody on the live chat, everybody who decided not to be on the live chat, everybody who unsubscribed or who disliked. It doesn't matter. You guys are still watching. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys, so I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the fans. But this one, you know, I don't really get too excited for a lot of them, even though I enjoy all of them, but... I get excited when you get a West Coast legend sitting across from you and we get to talk hip hop. We get to talk about West Coast rap. And uh, so without further ado, please allow me to introduce the one and only West Coast legend, Eight. How you doing, Eight? Good, yeah. You know what, man? Uh, like I said earlier today, I'm glad that you're here. Glad you're able to make it. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Big Steel and I want to thank yourself and the whole, you know, uh, Gangster Chronicle podcast for having me on. For sure. So I had a lot of fun. I got a lot of good feedback and some negative right. from my own people, but it's all good. Right. You know, but you know what? I just wanted to jump right into it because I, I there's a lot of things that I have been wanting to ask you for the longest time. And I finally get to do it in front of an audience here. Uh, the first time I heard of you was through my manager, my manager, Steve Yano, okay. who, um, who was very good friends with the unknown and Unknown was always bragging about a group called CMW. And one day they brought a Techno Hop 12 inch and they played as a song. And ever since then, I became a fan. So, my question to you is how did you meet Unknown or DJ Slip, who pretty much did the majority of production? Um, me and um, Chill. <clears throat> Who started out, you know, Chill was a beatbox when I first met him. And so um, we met in school, um, you know, around the time we was in the streets or whatever, you know, everybody know that story. Um, but um, it was these cats that lived across the street from Chill, and uh, they were trying to be singers. Um, so um, they basically... Um, they took us out to, um, I think I want to say Ontario. Okay. They took us out to Ontario where we was able to cut a demo tape. Um, I don't know. I wrote me and Chill some verses to a beat we had got that this dude had did. Um, it was a place where they was cutting demos at. Okay. Can't remember the guy's name, but anyway, we cut a demo. Um I think the name of it was called uh, Kicking Up Shit or Kicking Dust or whatever. Um, so maybe a week later, two same singing cats were uh, going over to Lonzo's. They was going to have a meeting over at Lonzo's. Um, so basically, we just tagged along, me and Chill, because it was about them right. trying to get, uh, you know... Um, I think uh, Lonzo and them had turn off the lights at the time. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, they were trying to get in on that aspect. Um, <clears throat> so we just tagged along. Um, and um thing at the meeting, uh, Slip was there. Okay. And then, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, Unknown was there as well. Um we played our demo tape just on the whim. Um, I think they kind of liked it. You know, who knows what it was, you know, what they saw, you right. know. Um, so um, we actually cut a record with Slip. We got introduced to Slip because Slip was doing all the production at the time. Um, and he was working on a record, a Compton compilation okay. for Lonzo. Um so we uh, basically got with Slip and came up with Rhymes Too Funky. Okay. And that album came out, uh, basically it was the Compton compilation. It came out on Crew Cut, on Lonzo's label. Um, from there, uh, I guess it was discussed that uh, we would flow over to Techno Hop because Lonzo was doing other things at the time. So uh, basically, we got handed to unknown. 
Oh, wow. Um, and that's when we started working on the Techno Hop release. Okay. Yeah, because I, I remember the Techno Hop, the 12-inch yellow and had some red on yeah, it. They, yellow had red like graffiti writing. Right. Uh, before we came along, um, there was uh, King T was on Techno Hop. Yeah. Um, Ice T was on Techno Hop. Um, and a couple of uh, other little singles and records are known had put out uh, Dezo Daz and uh, 808 Beats and That's whatever, right. you know. He had a couple of other things, like a lot of little techno stuff. So, um, that's actually how we got hooked up with Unknown. Yeah, because when I got that single, I really, really dug it. And if I'm correct, that single, I, I believe it was This Is Compton, right? Yeah, the single was This Is Compton, uh, Give It Up, and I Give Up Nothing. Okay. So it was three songs on the single. Yes, I, and I remember that because that's when I became a, a fan of CMW. It was through Techno Hop. Right. You know, now I, I had saw where Snoop was on Drink Champs, and they asked him a question, and he said, CMW, and then he goes, I used to battle them in high school. Yes. C can you kind of shed a little bit of light on that? Um, you know, rap was getting real popular back when we were in high school. Um, so everybody started, you know, picking up the, uh, you know, the rap bug. Yeah. Um, and taking lessons from New York, mm -hmm. you know, things used to battle. Um, Snoop, who's, you know, one of our uh, good friends we came up with, you know, from high school and all that, us being from Compton, him being from Long Beach, uh, we actually went to school in Long Beach. So um, me and Chill went to school in Long Beach. Long Beach Poly. Uh, no, we went to junior high. Oh, junior high school. We went to Hamilton Junior High School. Okay. Um, so we used to have rap battles, you know, just, you know, battling dudes. And so one day um, we all met up at the park in Long Beach and Snoop was up there and we, we, we used to battle. We used to go at it, you know, uh, trying to uh, tighten our skills, so to speak, at an early right. age. You know, good competition. Uh, so uh, definitely. Snoop was uh, one of those early uh, cats that we used to run into and have, you know, good friendly battles with. You know, never no issues, but you know it was good because that's basically what rap stood on back then. You know, taking, uh, like I said, taking a page out of New York. You know, uh, a lot of uh, their foundation was built on battling. You know. Uh, this was before dissing and all that shit came along. So, um, yeah, uh, friendly battles was always good to, uh, you know, tighten up your skills. Right. Okay. You know what? Now, a couple of people submitted this question, and I wanted to ask you uh, this question about CMW, Compton's Most Wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. It says MCA, chill, and then they ask, ask them about Boom Bam mm -hmm. and DJ Mike T., are they still a part of CMW? What happened that they're no longer with CMW? Um, the, uh, Mike T is still a part. Okay. Um, the other cat we don't affiliate with. Okay. Uh, uh, trial run, family shit. You know, okay. basically that's what that was. Um, basically just, you know, him, you know, being with us because – he was uh, associated through uh, neighborhood ties okay. and uh, family, you know. Okay. Uh, Mike T, um, we met Mike T maybe after we start putting together the first record. There used to be a cat named Ant. Okay. Uh, DJ Ant C. Uh, he uh, lived in, uh, in Compton. In Elm Street hood. Okay. Uh, so um, we all basically went to Hamilton Junior High School together in North Long Beach. Um, at the time, like I said, rap was rap bug was biting us all. Um, Chill used to beatbox. I used to rap. Ant was, you know, DJ. Um, we used to go over to Ant's house because Ant had. The, the 1200s and the mixer and all of that, yeah. you know, and 
for us wanting to get into the game, <clears throat> he was, you know, he had the equipment, he had a place where we can chill and, you know, try to craft the skills, what have you. Um, so um, he did a little scratching on Rhymes Too Funky. Right. Um, when we hooked up with Unknown and it was time to make records. Right. They brought in Mike T. Mike T was more, you know, there was Eric B, the DJ. Right. And then there was Joe Cooley, the DJ. Okay. Mike T was more Joe Cooley. Okay. You get me? Ant was more Eric B, you know, simple, nice scratches, whatever. But Mike T was the trickster, transforming, doing all of that. So we use Mike T basically as the designated scratcher on the first album. Um, after that, um, everybody kind of went separate. Um, we got picked up by uh, Orpheus Capital yeah. after the techno hop run. Uh, we got picked up by a major and a known who was running the ship at the time. Yeah. He brought in Mike T. Okay. And that's how that went. Okay. Bring up that first picture. Uh, uh, I have the picture of your first album because I remember when it's going a to. Mm -hmm. Yes. When we went to the swap meet, I was said, I asked Steve, you, you got that CD? You got that CD? Yeah, I got it right here. Give me the album. Give me two albums and whatever 12 inches. Because I, I, being a DJ, you, you buy doubles of everything. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, so, so that was the first one that I bought. But I never seen the other cat on any other album. So I was. Yeah, Mike. he he actually um he probably didn't scratch on any records mm. on the first album. Like we had rhymes too funky on there, yeah. but like I said, um when you listen to the cutting on it's a Compton thing or the next record or the next record, that was all done by DJ Mike T. Okay. 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 Now one of the twelve inches was uh I believe uh I want to make sure that I get this right. I don't want to mess this one up because I remember when I saw this, I asked Steve, I said, Hey man, has anybody said anything about that? One time got for them up 12 inch. Right. Can, can you bring that up? Okay. The second one. Now you got chill right there. Right. And he's holding up the fence. Right. Now I remember Steve had it cause you know, he had him up against the, the wall and I walked up and I said, Steve, let me see that, that single. So he gave it to me, and I go, has anybody told you anything about this? And he goes, yeah, bro. He goes, I, I, I get shit for it. And I was like, really? Because at the, at the Rodeon Swamp Meet, you had Crips and Bloods back then. Oh, definitely. So I was like, has anybody said anything? He goes, no, not really. He goes, but people ask, can I see it? So was he just holding up a fence, the fence, or was he sending out a message? Um, I, never, uh, I never caught that. Uh, chill holding the fence like that. Um, I don't know if he was personally trying to send out a <laughs> message. Um, everybody knew what we were right, know, right. representing at the time. Um, but uh, I was never asked, I've never been asked about that. Uh, really? We, um, I think because you know, every, our first album was Blue. You know, our our first cassette was blue. It was all blue. Um, so we we basically uh, were solidified just by that, just by right, having right. a blue tape and coming from Compton, Compton's Most Wanted. So people kind of had the idea. Yes. And, you know, at that time, you know, the streets were still treacherous. Yes. Uh, with with Crippin' and Blood. Yes. So, um we we had our fair share of run-ins because of our affiliation, but uh, as far as that go, I couldn't even tell you if that was something Chio just did or you know, niggas had their own agenda. So <laughs> shit, I I couldn't even tell you. I thought that, I'll be honest, I thought it was bold, and I thought that was cool. I'm like, okay, it ain't afraid. Fuck it. Ah uh, shit. I mean, it wasn't like. It wasn't like we were hiding, you know, our affiliation back then. Um, you know, record labels hated it. So that's why we kind of tried to steer away from it uh -huh. just by uh, 
running the streets back then before rap. I mean, we we were just, we were like every other motherfucker around yeah. here. Whether you was black, Mexican, whatever, we were all claiming neighborhoods. Yes. You feel me? Yeah, that came that album came out early nineteen ninety, if I'm correct. Yes, it came out the beginning of ninety. I think we worked on it uh all eighty nine. Yes, yes. Before I go through some of the tracks on there, you could take it down now. Uh, for the people that are watching, can you kind of, who possibly have never been to Compton before, can you kind of, through your eyes, tell us what Compton was like growing up in the 80s? Can you give us a, a, a picture? For me, uh, Compton growing up in the 80s, I mean, shit. Neighborhoods were were typical, you yeah. know. Uh, look, middle class. Um, beach cruisers and 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 Compton swap meets. Uh, ice cream trucks coming down the street. Uh, the donut truck coming down the street. Um, it, it was a good time for me as a kid. I mean, shit. The Compton Christmas Parade and and just being able to ride your bike. I mean, you know, uh, I think at the at the time of of being young in Compton, you were naive to the gang shit. Um, I probably was one of those kids yeah. from the age of you know five years old to twelve. It was shit. I didn't know. I didn't know of poverty and living in low income and shit like that. It was it was like regular life to me growing up. Um I didn't want for shit, you know what I'm saying? Right. As 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 you are able to see now as a grown man what you went through as a child, um some people would think you had a hard life. I didn't look at it like that. Um yeah. Going to school with my friends and shit like that, uh, Louis Burgers and going to the parks and shit like that, and just being able to get on my beach cruiser and ride through the neighborhood and go to the dairy and yeah. buy now laters and shit like that. Um, <laughs> the number one ghetto candy. Yeah, come yeah. on, man. <laughs> shit, now laters and baked beans and lemon heads and shit Chico like sticks. that. Man, Chico sticks and shit like that. It was, uh, you know, and I grew up in um, I grew up in a neighborhood called Spooktown. So mm -hmm. it was Mexicans and blacks. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of my friends were Mexicans, blacks. I mean, we played murder ball in the street, you know, marbles <laughs> and shit like that. So life in Compton was pretty good to me growing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, I had shared on Gangster Chronicles that uh, half of my family was born in, in Mexico. The other half was born here. When my family came from Mexico, we moved to Compton right there, 152nd. Mm -hmm. That's where we grew up there until I was about nine years old. And then we moved here. So this is where I pretty much uh, grew up. Now, everything that you described, I pretty much went through here as a young child. And uh, I, here was blacks. Um, I think that's why Banning High School and Carson used to be rivals because we had such a diverse uh people here in the city we had mexicans blacks samoans filipinos and even whites my mother went to uh she graduated from banning high school really yeah wow. my mother came from gulfport mississippi and she went to high school at banning high school so yeah i have family who live out here oh wow yeah. that's dope that's dope so and then now before i get into mine i want you to share what was it like in compton when the crack epidemic hit Oh wow! Um, but once again, from your eyes, wow. Um, I was young. Uh, started, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, really didn't see a future of of doing anything else but you know, gang banging. Um, it was at the height of of. Oh wow! It just seemed like it it came in right at the height of of where all the tension in the streets was, and so it just added fuel yes. to the fire, man. And um, crack epidemic, we saw you know a lot more drive bys. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of us as youth who were coming out of that innocence of, you know, Captain Crunch cereal on Saturdays <laughs> watching Super Friends and shit like that. Uh, it introduced us to wanting to grow up fast. Yeah. Um, I was one of those kids yeah. who were fascinated with the, with the crack epidemic. Um, I saw uh, the money. I saw the stature it gave a lot of youngsters in the neighborhood. Um, you know, cats my age, 15 and 16, riding around in brand new El Caminos and 6'4s and Volkswagen Bugs with the tops cut off. And, you know, uh, it, 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 you know, 10 of us on the corner all trying to rush cars to try to make twenty dollars, you know. Um <laughs> curse urban. Because it was it was it was our way of life, you know. None of us uh considered the, you know, stay in school model and the drugs and all that shit. We looked at that as as our our, our pastime, our way of life, you know. Yeah. Get you a double up fifty and hit the corner and and go for broke. Um some niggas became big time dudes off of it, you know. Some up, some niggas just used it as a way to just survive, you know. Yeah. Um, I was one of those cats, you know. I I looked at it as, you know, as a way to try to survive, to not put pressure on moms, you know. Single moms raising three kids, we living in Compton, you know, low income. Uh, she trying to struggle to provide us with with shit that really she can't afford but right. she's working jobs and so i looked at it as a way to take stress off of her from trying to put money in my pockets as a 14 15 16 year old kid um all i really wanted to do was buy new shoes and new khaki suits and and shit like that. I never looked at, you know, trying to be Tony Montana because uh, still being in that life, uh, mom struggled to teach you the right shit. So um, I struggle with that, you know, the streets and, you know, trying to please moms and not yeah. be the, you know. So uh, it, it was just a way to try to take the stress off of everyday life. You know what I'm saying? I could feed yeah. myself. I could clothe myself. I don't have to go to moms and say, hey, can you give me money so I can go to the swamp meet and cop some, some pants or some white tees or whatever. So that's what the crack era was for me. It fucked a lot of people up, though. Yeah. You know, um, family members got on drugs. You know, people that we was in school with, you know, turned yeah. to cluck heads and shit. Um it, it it was it was it probably was fascinating to the young gang banging hustler, but in reality it fucked a lot of shit up. You yeah, get me? Did how you know you could just imagine how many dudes right now are either gone or in jail for jacking somebody for Dayton's. Oh definitely. We we had our times, man, coming through the eighties. We had critical times, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, rap was at an all-time high with especially like Public Enemy, Eric being Rakim, EPMD. It was all coming over here. Oh, definitely. You know. We, uh, the neighborhood, uh, we started, you know, when rap hit for us over here, it, w it was, a, um, I say it was a, a form of release for the, for the young, for the young motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, 15, 18, 19, 20. Uh, yeah. Starting to hear motherfuckers like the Fat Boys and <laughs> and 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 UTFO, <laughs> UTFO, and and Boogie Down Productions and Roxanne, and it 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 basically turned the notch up on a lot of shit because you know that music uh, was a different passion for us. That you know, even though you know in the neighborhood you listen to your Parliaments and your Zaps and your Odies. I think when certain rap came out, it 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 gave the youth another way to uh, express. You know, when you, when you was gang banging, man, that was just everything for you. So Fuck, it was fuel. That that yeah, that music like was gasoline on fire, man. For us, as far as just being in the neighborhood, like us, we didn't have any ways out. You know, 
you was either gang banging or you was dope dealing, and you was probably doing both. I remember when I started seeing all my homies, because I was just a nickel and dimer. I saw all my homies slanging, and I saw them had the girls, they had the cars, you know. It was everything. Everything. It was man. everything back then. Uh, I, I, you could have been ugly. I'm, I, I'm not trying to diss nobody. You could have been ugly as hell, but if you had the money, you had the, the whip. Oh, no, you had a fine bra, you know <laughs> what I'm saying, the top-notch female. If you were still, man, it brought you everything. It brought you stature. Stature, I mean, being yeah. a... Uh, a young drug dealer in the neighborhood. Uh, it brought you a certain, uh, you know, a certain swag, <laughs> like they say today. Um, and like it, it was everything. You, you, like you say, you could be the ugliest motherfucker, the fattest motherfucker. It didn't make no difference. You had the sack, and you had the cars, and the pagers, and and the phone, the brick phone. Man, you was on shit. You was on definitely. Yeah. You know, it's funny because, so when I saw all my homies making money, I thought to myself, I could do this. So I went up to one of my homies and I said, let me get a 5 double up. And he told me like this, what do you want to do with this? And I said, well, I want to do what they're doing. You know, and he was like, okay, I'm going to tell you this right now. Either you're going to go all the way or get out. And right. I said, okay, why? And he said, because you're just going to end up dead or in jail. That's it. Right. You get two choices, dead or in jail. And that's, and I'll be honest with you, that scared the hell out of me, man. Um... So I did it for about about a year, and you know what was the first thing I bought was the, the Jordan ones, mm -hmm. and then a, a brand new realistic mixer. Mm. I um, I probably did it for about a year. Same. Um, you're basically looking for your you're looking for your path, man. When you undecided at around that time. Um, like I said, because you come from innocence, man. As a young kid, like I said, ice cream trucks and <laughs> and uh, skateboarding and bike riding around the neighborhood. Like, you living as a kid. Yeah. But uh, some things happen and you grow up fast. And especially if you're growing up in poverty, man, uh, you want a lot of shit. Yes. Uh, and then if you're looking at, like, like I tell motherfuckers, um, some of that innocence you lose because you don't see yourself um, becoming like, look at what's around me. You get me? Right. Um, opportunities for young kids today are great. You yes. get me? Uh, there's a lot of programs and, and shit that people can get into to further their positive ambition. Me, as a fucking 12-year-old, I didn't have shit. Like, were you going to be a football player? Nah, I'm hanging in the streets. You yeah. get me? Um, I, want a, I want a sack. I don't see nobody else who didn't come from what I, is in the pot. Right. You know, niggas is struggling, working at motherfucking hard-ass jobs to make a, you know, I can make this shit in one day. One day. That's the ambition we had. Um we didn't have a lot of opportunities. That's why I tell motherfuckers shit. By the time gang banging came around and crack selling, my ambitions or dreams as a little kid, you know, you're a little kid, or I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a policeman. I'm, you know, that's your dreams as a kid. Yeah. That's what your parents try to put you on, that, that, that American dream. You get me? <laughs> you can do whatever you want to. You go to school, work hard, but shit. In reality, nigga, I'm going to school. Niggas fighting every day. We trying to, you know, the enemy coming up to the school. We yeah. got to fight them. You you going home, riding your bike, or you traveling through different neighborhoods. You got to go through that reality. Then you get home, and you got brothers and sisters and a struggling parents, and shit is like, your mind state becomes like, man, I need to join up. Oh, I need to get me a sack and start. Be so your your motherfucking dreams of becoming a normal motherfucker fly out the fucking window. Yeah. So that's what happened to me. My everything was about the neighborhood. It wasn't even about no fucking rapping or shit. It was just about I, I'm the neighborhood. I'm going to the neighborhood. That's why I tell motherfuckers even even three albums deep 
as Compton's most wanted. It was still like shit. I'm going to the neighborhood. You don't know how to escape that because that's that's shit. That that's what that's all I saw. I didn't yeah. see nothing else. I didn't even see being a rap star with three records out. I was like, fuck that. Compton, the neighborhood, and that's first. You know how you be in the military, they tell you it's God country or whatever they say. <laughs> Nigga, that's what it was for us. It's the neighborhood and fuck everything else. So even though you got a record out and motherfuckers seeing you on videos and shit, your, your motherfucking mind state is shit. I'm, I'm still, you know, trying to represent the neighborhood. That's what it was about. Yeah, yeah. So your first record album drops. Okay, I'm, I'm going to name you the songs, okay. and I'm going to tell you my classic songs. Okay. Okay, the first one, uh, they may not be by order, but One Time Gaffle Them Up, definitely one of my all-time favorites. One Time Gaffle Them Up was our first single off of It's a Compton Thing. Yes. Uh, on the same album, I'm With That. I'm With That was, uh, yeah, I'm With That's one of my favorite, too. That one, Final Chapter. Final Chapter was one of those. Uh, Slip was very creative with mm. his beat making. Yes. Uh, he was never the typical. You get me? A lot of, lot of motherfuckers came up using the same shit. You know? Let me use a little George Clinton. Let me use a little right. Parliament, a little Zap, a little Funk. You know, uh, Slip was one of those dudes who um, he was strong on just buying records. He didn't give a fuck what it was. If yeah. the cover looked crazy, he'd <laughs> buy it. Um, and then within that record, he would go through it and listen to each song and he would find shit and he knew how to chop shit up and piece it together. So a lot of Compton's most wanted sound was built off a of slip, being able to just have an ear for music. Yeah, you get most me? definitely. Now this next one, I really, really liked, but I didn't hear you rap this style in so many, I think only on the second album, but we'll get to that one. I give up nothing. Oh, yeah. Um, you know what that reminded me of? On some follow the leader type of shit. Yeah, I give up nothing was one of those. Because like I said, um, I called myself MC first. Um, I I was real big on, on MCing, like rapping. Yeah. Um, even though we was representing a particular style and format of rap because of being on the West Coast and being from Compton, um, I was a fan of, of hip-hop, period. Yeah. Um, I grew up on East Coast shit. Um, yeah. And so being able to rhyme was big for me, uh, not just talking about uh, 48, 40 ounces and crack and 38 pistols and gang banging and low riding. I want to for show sure motherfucker I can rap. Like, you know, because like I said, I was a fan of true hip hop. So I give up nothing was one of those beats that slip, you know, presented to me. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. You get me? Uh, and I want to rap on it. And being an MC. Yeah. You always have to feel like shit, nigga. I can rap off of anything because yeah. I'm a true artist at heart. So that's where I give up nothing came from. I, I used to rewind that shit. I was like, man, that's the only song like this on this album. Yeah. That came off of doing, um, it basically found its way on the album because it was the first uh, three cuts we had ever put out. We put out This Is Compton, uh, Give It Up, and I Give Up Nothing. Those were the first uh, songs on Techno Hop as a 12 yeah. inch. So, since we already had those in the bag, uh, Anon just decided to stick them on the album. Okay, okay. So, I give up nothing. This is Compton, is probably my all time favorite song. And my second would probably be I'm with that. Uh, yeah, I'm with that. Mm -hmm. Then we have track number six, Rhymes Too Funky, part one. Right. Okay. Number seven, Duck Six, another classic. Right. Okay, man, I, it was funny because everybody out here in my city, we bit that. We should tell bitches, you can get the ducks in. Right, that's where that came from. Uh, <laughs> we used to be a crew of, of many when we were hanging out, putting together the uh, CM Dub's first record. Uh, me, Slip, uh, my man Rockin' Tom, uh, Chill, 
um, Mike T. Uh, we just used to hang. And so just being around each other, we used to always come up with, with, with little words that we would identify with. Duck sick, uh, killing them off side by each. Uh, you know, everybody used to say Audi 5000. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we were trying to create our own lane and our own persona. So duck sick was one of those things that, you know, just like I came up with Gia, you know, it's just, it was just one of those things we wanted to uh, put our stamp on being our own, you know. We didn't want to be um, looked at as the little brothers of NWA. Uh, oh, okay. So we we were very big on trying to form or form our own position. You get me? Okay. Okay. Track number eight, Give It Up. Track number nine, La- Late Night Hype. Late Night Hype. Ten, I mean business. Mm-hmm. And 11, it's a Compton thing. So if you can recall the titles, if I had to twist your arm and ask you, which is your favorite cut on this album, what would you say? I would probably have to say I'm with that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with that was very... Um, I'm with that was a song that let me know that we had arrived as a true rap. Um, I put my all into writing that song. Uh-huh. Like I said, I just wanted to be, we, I didn't want us to look, be looked at as a copycat of something else. Um, hmm. NWA was very strong. Easy was very strong. Ice Cube was very strong. Um, with us saying Compton's Most Wanted and having the moniker CMW, of course everybody was going to go NWA, CMW. Um, we just wanted to be different. Yeah. So when we did songs, we always want to have our own identity. And I think that's what we did with songs like I'm With That, songs like I Give Up Nothing, Final Chapter, uh, it took you away from just the regular element of these just some dudes from Compton uh, gangbang rapping, you know. Yeah. It showed you, no, these motherfuckers can rap. They can rap. Yeah. It ain't just uh, this song is the 40 and the gun or this song is the whore and the, and the dope, you know. Yeah. Songs like Final Chapter, I Give Up Nothing, I'm With That. Those were rap songs. Yeah. Me? So, so now the album drops in 1990, early 1990. Yeah. Um, what was the feedback you were getting? What was the response you were getting from it? Um, I, to be honest, uh, around the city uh, at that time, they had the video jukebox. Yes. Um, so we were able to sit at home and watch One Time Gaffle play every 20 minutes, every 10 minutes. <laughs> that was a dope thing back then. Um, like I said, um, we were still gang banging and real. So you had to understand that um, now you're opening yourself up for not just niggas who knew you through high school and around the neighborhood. Now everybody know. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. Um, but I had, I could say that for what it was worth, uh, the feedback was pretty good. Okay. Um, like I said, we didn't try to, my main focus when we, uh, made songs was not to alienate the other side. Um, I want everybody to play my shit. Right. Right. I wanted Crips. I wanted Bloods. I wanted Essays. I wanted there. So I didn't try to be heavy influential on uh, hey we crips over here you know right. crip, 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 crip this and you know um i wrote songs for the general public of us you yeah. get me yeah um you niggas in wilmington is is hustling y'all getting raided y'all getting dumped on y'all drive-bys coming through we're going through the same shit over here yeah niggas in long beach y'all going through that shit too uh, the Bloods in L.A., y'all going through that shit, too. The yeah. Crips in fucking wherever, y'all <laughs> going through that shit, too. So I didn't want to just, you know, emphasize the different, you know, yeah, 
Yeah. Nah, nigga, we all in the same gang, and I don't give a fuck. And we might be, you know, we might have came across or had some instances or whatever, but I bet you went through the same shit I went through last night. Absolutely. I bet you one of your homies went through what my homie went through. Yeah. You get me? We was all going to funerals in, in, in fucking jail houses. You feel me? Yeah. And they give a fuck what color you, you wore. Yeah. We all was going downtown. And then, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of us was, go- a lot of the homies was seeing the motherfucking dirt. And everybody was going downtown. It yeah. didn't give a fuck. Yeah. You was going to the county. It didn't matter what color you was from. It, that's, that's you was true. from the hood. You was slagging, banging, and do whatever. You was going downtown. So I, I wrote my raps for that. So I didn't try to alienate. Uh, so the, the, the general acceptance was, Damn, you get me? We got some more niggas coming from where we come from, and they're not too commercialized. These niggas is talking about a nigga pulled a drive-by last night. You know, these niggas is talking about the nigga came through and whooped. They were not only are there, they not glorifying shit. These niggas is telling the truth about yeah. Damn, nigga, I just got out the pen. Nigga won't give me a job. I can't do this. I can't do that. So I'm finna go back to result to hitting the streets. You get me? Yeah. Uh, nigga, if you was claiming the neighborhood, the hood took you under. You get me? You getting in the city? I, I wrote songs like that on on um on the first album. It's a Compton thing. I was just trying to solidify us as. MCs and yeah. rappers. Okay. We had song, like I said, you had one time gal for the month who talked about neighborhood and the homies and go, go got jacked and so-and-so got shot at. And this nigga was selling drugs. And this nigga was, it was a typical what yeah. goes on in the neighborhood every day. But then, like I said, I wrote songs like duck sick. I wrote songs like Final Chapter, I Give Up Nothing, because I wasn't just trying to go, hey, we some hood niggas from Compton. I was trying to let y'all know, even though Compton's Most Wanted got MCs and we can rap. Look at the variety. Now, you know, so that's how it went. I never wanted to um, have motherfuckers pick a side, you get me? Yeah. Yeah. Even though the cassette was blue and all that shit, I didn't... That wasn't our choice. That was the label's choice. And it wasn't like, oh, these guys are from Compton, so let's make them a blue tape. It just so happened that year, EMI made all of their tapes blue. Mm. The OJ's cassette was blue. Our cassette was blue. You get me? Okay. It was something EMI decided to do. Okay. You know, you know, on the first album, when you, know, you pretty much let it out where you were from, who you guys were with, when you guys started traveling and started doing shows, did you guys ever face any hostility? I could say, um, for the most part of Compton's Most Wanted's uh, rap tenure, we didn't face too much hostility. Okay. Um, like, again, um, to me, it was about respect. Okay. Um, of course, we pulling up in towns where it's highly crip favored. We're pulling up in cities where it's highly blood favored. You got to know how to respect the motherfucker. I've done shows where it was a thousand bloods in the audience. And I'm going to do my show. I ain't going to hit a motherfucker up. I ain't going to tell them, nigga, we, we the shit. This is that. I'm going to do my show and say thanks for coming and good night. And even though a nigga from a difference from me, he paid his money to come up in there and listen to some Compton's Most Wanted. Now, you already got an idea of what we represent, but I tried not to push that on right. motherfuckers. Yeah. You get me? So it was all, it's always been about respect. Um, like I said, maybe 90%. Yeah, there were times where we had to, you know, uh, put our backs against the wall and, right, right. and, but that's any situation, you know, when people dislike you just yeah. for being, you know, a motherfucker just dislike a motherfucker for, for waking up. So, some people just like that, you know? Yeah. You know, I had met high C, I want to say late 
80, 88. I, I, I believe it was around there. The next following year, I made Quick uh, uh, through High C, Quick, Second to None, AMG. And then uh, they, were do, uh, they were all my mixtapes. And then Quick releases, a, he had a song on a demo tape. It was on an eight track. And we were at Greedy Greg's house. I, I believe you probably met him, mm-hmm. Greedy Greg. Okay. And we were at his house. And I want to say it was probably 89, late 89. And he played us a song called Real Dope. That's mm-hmm. what it was called. And then he said something like, I'm up on the tree for CNW. I've heard see. that. I've heard that. So I was like, so I caught on because from Techno Hop, listening to This Is Compton, I'm a CMW fan. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, like, what the hell was all that about? I didn't say nothing, but I did ask him. I said, hey, man, uh, we're releasing this mixtape at the Rhodium. You mind if we put that song on? And he was like, no, nah, go for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we went ahead and put it out. And then everybody was like, oh, we got to get that CMW disc tape. CMW disc tape. And I still have the original cassette. So, but here's the crazy part. As much as he dissed you on a song, whenever I was around him, and I was around him a lot, he never once brought you up. Like, never once, like, hey, I saw eight, or fuck that fool, or this eight. We or- never, um, we never crossed paths. Okay. Um, I tell everybody, um, because a lot of people, how did that start? Yeah. And a lot of people don't know about that, the, the, the demo tape. Um, I think we had already had uh it's a compton thing had already dropped the album mm-hmm. we were about to drop straight checking them and uh oh we was working on straight checking them and uh my t my dj who's a blood he had that tape oh shit and he brought it to the studio and he said hey listen to this this is something out from the top of the tree of shooting cmw he said something about easy on the tape mm-hmm. nwa i I never took it personal. Um, I knew hip hop was bred on back and forth banter. Niggas was battling and dissing each other. Um, And this is just like I told a motherfucker uh, the other day on my show. There are differences between dissing, diss, a diss, and a beef. Yeah. Um, I didn't have no beef with Quick. Um, like I said, uh, I looked at it as I got to get recognized. What's a better way to get recognized than dissing niggas who are already out? And I'm from the other side, so it's clever, right? Right, um, right. Because then, like you said, everybody's going to want the tape. Yeah. And if you're trying to get in the game, it's a good way to solidify. And then, like I said, you already got the street element to play with it because I'm a crip and he's a blood. And so, you know, right. that, 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 that pushes the issue a little bit more. So, um, but when I heard it, I didn't think, you know, anything of it. Okay, that's what motherfuckers do. Shit. I've, now, heard, I've, we, heard, I've heard KRS diss MC Shan. Yeah. I've heard LL diss Kumo D. That's what I looked at it as. Yeah, exactly. I looked at it as this what motherfuckers do in rap. You yeah. feel me? Yeah. And then what was it? Easy. He dissed. Uh, was, was it those guys? Uh, um, that sang that song Cracker Jack? Was it Cracker Jack? Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now, what, was he the one that first threw the first diss out there, or did he think that you said something? Um, I had a song called Death Wish that had a line in it that said, biting me quick would mean you get my duck sick quick. And I guess because of the demo tape, they took that as a diss, a diss, because if you fired a shot, I'm not like I say, if you technically want to say he fired the first shot because of the demo tape, Mm. but I didn't do anything on this a Compton thing. I was looking like, shit, we, we straight. We got an album out. It's a demo tape. We right. got an album out. We're signed to Capitol Records. So, uh, but um, I guess when you heard that line, and if you're from that camp, and you heard 
Compton's Most Wanted all of a sudden come out and say, bite me quick mean you get my dick sucked quick, and you a funny man, and blah, blah, this, and, and nigga, blah, blah, it's your death wish, and gunshots, it's on and cracking from there. You get mm. me? Did you guys ever run into each other in person back no, then? No. Oh, and okay. as, as, as far as neighborhoods concerned, uh-huh. um... You know where Treetop was. You knew where Trag New was. We were right. on different sides of Compton. So, yeah. you know, and then at that time, I'm sure like I was, he was, we was all over the place. Yeah. I mean, we were, I mean, we were everywhere. Like, I probably didn't sit at home one weekend back between 92 and 96. I probably didn't stay a weekend at home. We was on the road every fucking weekend fuck i mean every weekend we were on the fucking road i think my busiest time was more 91 92 and after that i I didn't really care to go back out man yeah i think i was on the road from 91 every weekend 91 92 93 94 90 and then especially when um you know movie dropped and then you know the, the, the soundtracks and all of that and, and that's where i'm going next because yeah, your record came out 1990 91 92 93 so i yeah. can see how your schedule is so going so crazy so now straight checking them before we get to some of those songs that dropped in 1991 so a year later but in 1991 also boys in the hood movie drops right and you come out with growing up in the hood right now who got in contact with you for that song well, um, shout out my boy JD from the Lynch Mob. Mm. Um, at that time, uh, JD was living in Compton. Uh, I was still living in Compton. I was still in Spooktown. Uh, so um, we used to just hook up every day. He was one of the, you know, we had got very strong around that time as friends. So I used to go over to JD's house almost every day. And at the time, they were uh, shooting boys in the hood. So one particular day, I think uh, I had a one-time guy for the mile up was out. Uh, You know, like I said, we had the video on the jukebox. It was playing like every fucking 10 minutes. Uh, It was floating pretty good around L.A. Yeah. Uh, So we go up to the movie set of Boys in the Hood, and... uh, we just happened to be hanging out in the front yard of the house where they had the, uh, you know, the backyard party at yeah. Cube had just got out. And John Singleton walked right up to me, and he said, I love your song, One Time Guy for the Month. He said, I'm a big fan, and he said, I'm going to get you on the soundtrack. I didn't believe him. I was like, yeah, right. Wow. And maybe two weeks later, Unknown, we was at the studio, and Unknown said that he had just got hit up by Warner Brothers because they wanted us to do a song for the movie. And so wow. I was able to go to one of the screenings and watch the movie and watch the whole story and all that. And then I went straight to the studio after and came up with Growing Up in the Hood. Fuck. Who, who did that? Slip as well? Slip did that. And I believe he also did the remix. Yes. Me, personally, I like the remix better. I like the remix better, too. The More Bounce sample. That it's, motherfucker's it's, it's, hard. It's probably one of my best songs to date. Uh, you, you, know, you know what that reminds me of? As weird as it may sound, I told my son the other day, you know, you know, why, you know why I love that loop so slow? Because it reminded me when my batteries were going dead on my boombox. Mm-hmm. That motherfucker knocks. Tapes are dragging. <laughs> Yeah, that's that slowed down shit like they do down south in Texas. That screwed up shit. Yeah, but, um, yeah, that yeah, shit is um, hard. Yeah, slip, slip. Uh, like I said slip is skilled when it yeah. comes to that drum machine. Did, did you have? I'm sorry to cut you off, but I have to ask you since it's fresh on my mind. Did you have uh, any more contact, or did you get a chance to hang out, or uh, if you will, conversate much more with John Singleton? Rest in peace. Um. Anytime I would see John, he okay. gave me the utmost respect. Um, I think the last time I saw John was somewhere in Hollywood when he was doing Snowfall. 
Okay. And uh, we conversated. He he never um, he never made me feel like he was. You get me yeah. that too big to talk to or communicate. He never forgot that. So like I said, I respected that because anytime uh, I saw John out in public or anywhere, he he never forgot me. You know what I mean? Like, oh, eight, hey, hey, how you, man, I'm doing this new project. Yeah. He had actually invited me to come down to the set of Snowfall maybe about a month before he passed. So, Oh, wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah, he was good. Pe- he was definitely good people. Gave me my first uh, cameo in the movie, and he gave me my first soundtrack, and it became like the number one number one rap single in the country at the time. Fuck, that's dope, man. Um, because of time, because I have to respect your time, I'm gonna jump a little bit more. Okay. Okay. So, 1992, music to drive by. Mm. Uh, comes out, which I think not only the music, but the fucking album cover was fucking dope. Fuck. Right. Um, we just came off of Straight Checking Them. Straight Checking Them did pretty good. Uh, it produced um, uh, Growing Up in the Hood, which was the number one single. Uh, after that, um, Music to Drive By came along. I wanted to really focus on the struggles in the neighborhood. You know, the riots was, you know, the riots and all that shit. Um, So a lot of my songs, you know, on Music to Drive By, I wanted to focus on the homie who was still stuck in the neighborhood struggling for a way to get out. Um... I didn't want the record to be a fun record. I wanted, when you listen to music to drive by, I wanted it to take you through basically um, trying to survive. Uh, Growing up in places like, you know, Wilmington, Compton, Long Beach, you know, um, people look like as if we glorified gang banging and all that shit. That shit was rough. Yeah. Um, it was hard. It was rough. It was a struggle. Um, you never know. Today yeah. could be your last day. You know, uh, you out there, you trying to hustle, you know, jealous motherfuckers, yeah. you know. Like you said, motherfucker wants your rims. Motherfucker wants your radio. Um, the Watch simple, your girl. The simplest shit. You got damn right. Niggas was getting killed over females back in the day. Back, you get me? Yeah. Um, so we had songs like um, Niggas Struggling. We had songs like Hood Took Me Under. We had songs like Drive By Miss Daisy. Um, Dead Men Tell No Lies. Um, and in the cover... I came up with because I wanted motherfuckers to God damn, like that that's what that's a drive by. But I wanted to flip it and go music to drive by. So to basically anticipate the fact that this is what we do or this is what we listening to when we getting ready to go pull a hit. So this is the music that we drive by to. And those songs were nigga struggling. Nigga, I'm, the hood took me under. <laughs> you get me like, yeah. we finna go, we finna go pull a hit. And so that question I wanted to present to niggas by going music to drive by. What do you listen to when you getting ready to go do something? And I've heard from that album, I've oh man. You don't just know what we went to do with, with with your with man. You got me through this. You got me through this, man. I was in jail for about ten years, man. All I used to listen to was CMW and Hood took me under and, and niggas struggling and shit like so. I wanted that record to really resonate with niggas who were still in the struggle in the neighborhoods. Yeah. So you have um, it's a Compton thing, nineteen ninety. Straight checking them, nineteen ninety one. Then you had music to drive by 1992. So uh, back to back to back. Okay. Three albums. Which one of CMW is your favorite album? Music to drive by. Okay. Definitely. Um, 
I had fun making this a Compton thing and straight checking them. Um, but with music to drive by, um, I think we were at a different time as far as music is concerned. Yeah. Um, a lot of niggas was beefing with each other. Yeah. And I say beef, not dissing. Niggas was beefing. You know, there were people actually getting hurt behind our, our beefs because of our affiliations and our neighborhood shit. Um, so CMW kind of, music to drive by hit home for a lot of people, and me especially because it was a record that I wanted to really uh, relate to my kind of people, and not just black people. I yeah. wanted to relate to everybody who was living in a project or a poverty or in a neighborhood where niggas was drive-by killing and we was selling dope and, you know. yeah. I wanted to really hit home with that. So I think music to drive by was probably, it's probably a lot of people's favorite. Yes. Yeah. A, a lot of my homies favorite. 1990. Well, if you was a hood motherfucker, music to drive by was your <laughs> record, man. Come on. Absolutely. Absolutely. 1993 menace to society comes out. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have a song straight up menace. Possibly my last question. Um, how did the Hughes brothers get a hold of you? Um, we were just finishing up music to drive by. Um, the Hughes brothers, uh, I think they were living in Pomona at the mm -hmm. time, going to school. Um, they were L.A. cats. Yeah. You can't be in L.A. and not know about Compton's Most Wanted. So they were hip-hop fans first. Yeah. You get me? Um, they did a lot of shit for Tupac. So yeah. they knew the game. Right. Um, they shot a lot of Tupac's first videos. Yes. You know, Holla If You Hear Me, Brenda Got a Baby. They did a lot of Pac shit. Yeah. So they knew the hip hop game and they knew the West Coast hip hop game because they were in Pomona. Yeah. Above the law, cocaine, you know, so they know. Um, I just happened to be on tour. Uh, I got a call from my manager and said, these two young cats are about to do this movie, and they want you to come in to read. Me, um, I didn't think shit of it. Um, but the rapper movies... We're getting popular. Yeah. Uh, Tupac had Juice. Um, Cube had Boys in the Hood and Trespass yeah. with Ice T. Yeah. Stoney Jackson and all of them. Um, New Jack or was the New we Jack? We had City? New Jack City. We had motherfucking South Central. Yeah. Um, we had Colors. You <laughs> get me? The the movies were starting to come out. So the Hughes brothers wrote. Uh, with this other cat, Darren, I believe. They wrote Minister Society. And uh, they said they wanted me to come in and read. I didn't think nothing of it. I think they said me and Ren was, uh, they had wanted to go out for the AWAX part. Uh, so I came back from off tour. Uh, I went down, sat down at a table. I think I read one of the scenes for him. Um. Even though we motherfuckers from the streets and shit, I still went to school. You get me? <laughs> Moms get that switch off the tree and whoop your ass if you wasn't in school. So, I'm glad you said that. So I, 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 even though I was in school throwing up sets and hitting up on the peachy folder and all that shit, um, I went to school. And I got good grades. Um, so I could read. So that was the first thing that probably impressed the motherfucker was, oh, damn. This nigga can read. You get me? <laughs> so they called me back again. I went in again, and I think I did another scene for him. And I think just the ambiance of, of, of who I was, I wasn't out there like the actor, the real actor, right. and I wasn't like just a dumb, illiterate nigga. But my mannerism was whatever. You get me? Yeah. It's me every day. Whatever. Fuck it. You get me? Because if not, I'm still going to go back to the hood, smoke some weed, kick it with the homies. So um, 
I guess that mannerism, you know, they kind of liked because they saw what they saw and heard what they heard on the records, and then they actually get a nigga to come in, and it's like, oh, this nigga really cool as fuck. Yeah. So they called me back a third time. Oh, shit. And I went the third time, and after that, I think I was doing a show in Chicago, and they and my manager called, and they said, yeah, you got to come home because you got the part. Fuck. So it, it went as simple as that. And then we started having our table reads every week. You, you know, I do want to say something because you were a natural in that movie. And I'm going to tell you something. I know I know there must have been a bunch of jealous motherfuckers. I, I really like, I mean, um, I had some issues because, like I said, um, I still was in the hood. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I still was in the neighborhood. And um, so... Now I'm like put on, you know, the big, big screen. So now the small enemies have turned to big enemies. The small haters have turned to big haters. And I never put myself out like that in front of motherfuckers to make them feel like, oh, this nigga think he better than this now. Yeah. Oh, this nigga think he, I never did that, but. When you have natural motherfuckers who just don't agree and just don't like you just because of who you are, not because of something you've done to them or whatever. It's just we live in a world where shit, jealousy and haterism runs very rampant. Yes. And it could be the motherfucker right next to you. Right next it to you. It could be a nigga that you banged with and claimed the hood with all your life. And as, as soon as your struggle becomes a little less than his – then jealousy comes in, haterism comes in. And that's unfortunate because I don't claim to be any better than you, my nigga. It's just that I found my niche. You get me? Absolutely. I, did you get, mines wasn't slanging and, and whatever and becoming <laughs> Tony Montana. Fortunately, I was able to write down tales from the neighborhood and produce them to the masses of people who want to understand this lifestyle. So, but you, you unfortunately, you can't do shit about it. So, uh, around the time the movie came out, and and then we got to working on We Come Strapped. So, by that time, you got to start making life changes and yeah. decisions. You that shit looked like it was fun to filming. It was, it was a big video to me. Yeah. And then, the part I had to play, shit, nigga, we were doing that shit yesterday. In the neighborhood. We yeah. were sitting up at the homie house, smoking, watching TV, talking shit to I man, we was doing that shit yesterday. Yeah. We were standing in the alley yesterday. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. We were driving five deep to the gas station, piecing up on motherfucking a bottle of Thunderbird in a five dollar weed sack. I mean, we was doing that shit in real life. Shit. That's we, dope. So it came natural to me, certain certain situations in the movie. Um you know, the, the the jacking part, the shooting part, you know, just, I did that shit every day. Yeah. It, yeah. it wasn't like a nigga had to give me a, a acting class and say, hey, be like, like be like what? We was, we, I was doing this shit for the last 10 years before <laughs> y'all even showed up. Before a rap record even showed up in the neighborhood. We was hanging, banging, slanging, claiming, and, and you know. That's what the way of life was. So it was very uh, easy to take that script. And then most of my shit was just me being me. You get me? You the OG, the nigga who's already been through shit. So all you do is sit back and order niggas around and just, shit, that was easy. <laughs> shit. All good, my brother. Listen, because I know you told me you have a schedule to keep, and I got to respect that. I know a lot of you guys are going to be upset because you guys want to make calls. Hopefully... Hopefully, sometime in the future. I'm a, yeah, we're going to come back, and I'm going to bring Steel with me, and then we'll do sit down. We'll do the whole motherfucking call in and do all that shit. All that shit. Your boy just got a, you know, um, I got you know, a lot of shit is going on right Absolutely. now. Uh, you know, we got the podcast. I got a son in college. I'm um, working on new music. Um uh, it was just, it's just a lot of moving right now. And right. I am, um, and I, first of all, I just want to say I'm grateful 
to still be able to do shit like this, you yeah. know, because there's a lot of our forefathers and motherfuckers who came before us yeah. that are struggling uh, to uh, have that identity that we have right now. And so to be the age that I am and to see a lot, uh, to, to still be able to communicate, make music, and connect with motherfuckers who are interested in how this shit began and how it's still sustainable. Uh, you got to be grateful for shit like that. So I appreciate all y'all, the fans. Thank you. Thank you. Because you know what? I want to talk about your solo career. I want to talk about the DJ Premier uh, production that oh, yeah, you did. Definitely. There's just so much that I want to talk to him about. So hopefully we'll make that happen soon. Alex, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, quick question. I, w I was going to ask you, you said uh, earlier that a lot of uh, people got killed behind your affiliations and stuff like mm -hmm. that um would you say would you change anything if you could go back and do it again? i would change um now i'll never apologize for songs that i made you know me and quick got into it it was it was beef uh i never look at it and go like man oh i, I you know my bad i made that song I mean, shit, that's what we did. Yeah. I regret the beef because it went from records and it got into the streets. Yeah. And motherfuckers got hurt. Niggas got into fights and confrontations. Uh, somebody lost their life behind, you know, the, the situations. And I attribute that because when you're from different sides of the street, yeah. you have to throw that into the element. So if I could take back anything, it would be beefing because beefing is a different element of just dissing a nigga on wax. You get yeah. me? And it started off as friendly banter. He said his thing. I said my thing. But then when you're waking up the next morning and somebody on the slab in the morgue, you get me, yeah. behind, uh, you know. And you can't take it aside from, because like I said, we were from, we had to own that. You yeah. were claiming something, I was claiming something. And you know when you do that, motherfuckers going to look at you strange when you don't represent that's more important than any motherfucking thing. Yeah. That's more important than your rap career, your whoop the woman. And so sometimes you have to step into a role that you probably don't want to be in. You get yeah, me? Absolutely. But if if you 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 from over man, you from here, Tony. You know what it is when absolutely. it comes to California and neighborhoods and 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 situations like that. So it, it, it makes us look bad because hip hop is to save us, man. Yeah. You get me? And we were both representing the hub city and that shows a positive light when you can be, you know, so yeah. the beef and the shit, you know, I, I don't give a fuck about the rec the records. This records is, is this records is, is fucking needed in hip hop. We need that friendly competition every now and then, but we need to learn how to, you know, Keep it there. Control the punches and, and leave the straps put up. And like I said, you can't control the entourages and the other motherfuckers. So you just got to learn how to surround yourself with motherfuckers who want to see positive, too. You feel me? All good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, any shout outs before I get mine? Um, shout out to Gangsta Chronicles. We're going to shout out Rody and Radio. Shout out my boy DJ Premier Scarface. Two of my, um, my brothers in hip hop, you know. Them is two cats right there that I could call up right now just on some, hey, how you doing today? Um, I build relationships in this hip-hop thing, and so I appreciate that. So, But once again, Gangsta Chronicles, we're going to shout out uh, the Rhodium Radio, shout out my people at Drink Champs, um, and that's how we do it. All good. Uh, just a reminder, if you guys aren't subscribed to Drink Champs, make sure you guys subscribe because Ace about to be on it. He was yeah, just gonna on be on it. Yeah, we was just out in Miami, me and Steel, so we're going to be on the Drink Champs, MC8, the Gangsta Chronicles. So, y'all, make sure y'all tune in, man. We got we got great things coming up, man. Absolutely. Uh, let me give a shout-out to my crew, Alex Cervantes, Cervantes Enterprise, my son, B. Scandalous, the Hip Hop Jedi, Magical Raw Moderator, Marvelous Inc., uh, uh, Norbert News and Norbies. Uh, once again, uh, MC8, uh, uh, I just say eight. My apologies. And also, uh, Big Steel, Gangster Chronicles. Thank you guys. Much love and respect. See you guys here soon. Eight, much love and respect. Thank you for coming through, buddy. All day official. Chill. Oh.
Hasta la vista, baby. What's that, brother?